fourth NAN Connections tonight. My name is Kelly Thompson and I'm a neonatal nurse practitioner at Community Hospital in Munster, Indiana. I'm also chair of the membership committee who is hosting tonight's event. And I wanna thank all my colleagues on the membership committee and NAN staff, Molly and Olivia, who help make this possible every other month for us and do all the work behind the scenes to make these events come to make it possible for us to do these. So how NAN Connections came about was feedback we had received from NAN members and the 2020 annual conference attendees who shared that they wanted and needed more opportunities to connect with their peers from around the world. NAN will continue to host these similar events free to all neonatal nurses throughout 2021. If you have missed any and want to view them, please go to the NAN website and search NAN Connections and you will be able to view February's, April's, and June's NAN Connections, and also tonight's is being recorded. Before we get started, we wanna hear from you via our Zoom polling system. When prompted on the screen, please, feel, please share with us your primary nursing role so we can get an idea of who is with us tonight. If you don't see the prompt, feel free to write it in the chat box. We're gonna give it a few moments to see what the results come up as. So it looks like we have majority of bedside nurses, a little bit over 58%, and then it looks like our mid-level CNSs and NMPs are next. Um, so thank you everybody for attending. Also, the NAN Board of Directors is having their annual board meeting this week, and I know that some of them have made the time um, to add this onto their busy schedule today, and I just want to welcome those who were able to attend and thank them for all the work that they do for NAN and our profession. Thanks again, guys, for joining us tonight. So we're going to try one more question with tonight's topic, dealing with the loss. Please let us know how you deal with the loss at work. Do you do some debriefing with the staff? Do you do some self-healing after an event or none of the above? They're gonna post the question. for the poll to get everybody to submit their answers to see what. So it looks like a majority of the people on tonight do do a unit debriefing after a loss at work. Okay. And remember, for joining us tonight, you've been entered in a giveaway for a $100 gift card to Spa Finder to help add some more self-care into your lifestyle. You need to stay tuned to the wrap-up at the end of tonight's event to find out if you've won. You must be present on the call to claim your winning, your gift card. Okay, so now it is time, if you haven't already, turned off your camera so we can do our guided meditation. And let's get started. I'm thrilled to welcome Amy Kerman Gutzman from the Everyday Yoga Escape who will be doing a guided meditation session for us. Thank you, Amy, for taking the time to lead us in this session. Thanks so much for having me. I'm just going to share my screen quickly. And if you wouldn't mind, if you already haven't um, muted yourself, that'll help take out some of the background sounds. Great. Thank you for allowing me to be with you at this time. Take a moment to get comfortable. Feel free to lie down or to sit up nice and tall. You're sitting up, relax your shoulders. 
allow your body to settle in. Gently close your eyes. Start to breathe in through your nose and out through your nose or mouth. As you breathe, take a moment to notice your breath. Notice if it is deep or shallow. Start to find a rhythm without trying to change anything. As you listen to the sound of your own breath, Allow a sense of calmness to come over. Breathing in calmness. Breathing out. Let your focus come to this present moment. If your mind starts to wander, simply bring your focus back to your breath. You can silently say to yourself in on your inhalation and out on your exhalation, if that helps to bring you back. Day in and day out, you take care of others. Often you deal with stress and overwhelm. We see your bravery and know how much you give of yourself for others. We can give more of ourselves when we give back to ourselves and allow time for self-care. Give yourself permission in this moment to take a break. Right now, take this time to come away from everything else and allow yourself to just be here now. This is where you need to be. There's nothing else you need to do. Simply be here now. Breathing in and out. Give yourself this time to relax and visualize healing energy flowing all throughout your body allowing you to relax and recharge. Take a moment to visualize the most beautiful color you can imagine. Imagine this color is healing energy that's all for you. Start to picture all the cells in your body lit up with this color. Send love and gratitude all throughout your body. Visualize healing taking place all throughout as you light up each cell. Let's start at the top of the head and see this color coming in to move through us and bringing healing into each cell, bringing us back to home. Picture this color starting to come from your head out to your shoulders, down your arms and into your chest. 
your heart is illuminated with this healing light. Your lungs expand and breathe in healing energy with each breath. This light comes through your torso and into your back, healing and mending any areas of your body that are feeling tension, worry, and pain. We often hold emotions in different areas of our bodies. So picture this healing light, not only illuminating and energizing us physically, but mentally as well. Let the light and color flow down into your hips and down your legs into your feet all the way out through your toes everywhere along the way that needs healing love and gratitude feels that energy coming through your body starts to feel lighter and let go of tension on each exhalation As you send the energy of love and gratitude throughout your body more and more each day, your body starts to release pain, both physical and emotional. Sending positive energy all throughout. Imagine your whole body illuminated and glowing with the color of you. Let yourself bask in this glow for a few moments, breathing in healing and love, exhaling out anything that no longer serves you. When you are ready, start to gently wiggle your fingers and wiggle your toes. Come back into your body and gently stretch however it feels good to you. Remember that it's good for you to give yourself little moments during your day for calm even if it's just taking a moment for a deep, calming breath. As you're ready, slowly open your eyes. Return your attention back to the moment, but keep this calm, healing feeling with you. The light in me honors the light in each of you. Namaste. Thank you so much for letting me join you today. I send it back to you. Thank you so much, Amy, for leading us um, in tonight's meditation. That was wonderful. I think we're all in a better mindset for this important presentation on dealing with loss. Now it's time to turn your cameras back on. You can continue to keep yourself muted um, so we can feel connected throughout the rest of the event tonight. I would now like to take a moment to introduce our presenter, Dr. Chris Fortney, who is an assistant professor at The Ohio State University College of Nursing with a special focus on palliative and end-of-life care in the NICU. Welcome, Chris. Thank you so much. I'm gonna share my screen.
Okay, can you guys see my screen okay? All right, great. So thank you for joining me this evening. I really appreciate all of you being here when I know that there are so many competing interests and kids are getting ready to go back to school. Um, so I really um, do appreciate you taking the time tonight. I wanted to share with you just a little bit about my background in this area. I was a NICU staff nurse for 13 years, and during that time I cared for several infants who died along with their families. I participated on my unit's bereavement committee and also helped plan the annual NICU memorial service several years in a row. Um, when I struggled with how to provide end-of-life care, I looked for evidence-based guidelines to help me, and in finding little direction, I developed a passion for palliative and end-of-life care research. I also advocated for end-of-life training for staff and then developed and gave annual education lectures on this topic. In developing a program of research, I've collected data about infants and their experiences from medical charts, bereaved parents, and NICU nurses, and we've learned so much about the issues that surround babies who have been admitted to the NICU with a life-threatening or life-limiting illness. If you're interested in learning more, you can search my name on PubMed to find several articles there about the work that my team and I have completed to date. Or please reach out to me. I'm always happy to talk about this topic area. So let's get started. Tonight, I'm going to talk about loss and grief in the NICU and beyond. I have approached this talk from the perspective of nurses as helpers. I know that when I was practicing, I wanted to feel like I was doing something to be helpful in caring for those infants and their families. We truly are in a privileged position to be with families during this time, and what we say or do can have a definite effect on them for good or bad as they move forward. I think there are really two sets of skills here. In the NICU, we are limited by our professional boundaries as to how much we can help a family once they walk out those doors. But before they leave us, there is a lot we can do in that regard. And then with our friends, our family, our neighbors, there's even more that we can do. Then I'm going to define compassion fatigue and talk about ways to recognize it in ourselves and others. And then finally, I will outline some strategies that you can use to develop resiliency that will be helpful to you during tough times. So this is a short talk. It's about 35 minutes long, so I will really just be hitting the highlights here tonight. There will be a bit of time for questions at the end, and my slides will be made available to you. Um, but you can also feel free to reach out to me for more information if you have further questions. There are a few points that I wanna cover straight away. Let's define grief first. Grief usually refers to a deep emotional feeling that results from a specific loss. Certainly in the NICU, the loss we most often think about is the death of a patient. But an important thing that I want to say to you is that grief and loss can encompass more than death. While the death of a loved one or a patient, someone we've cared deeply about is profound and extremely painful, there are many other types of losses that we might also grieve, from loss of relationships, to loss of a job, loss of community, to loss of sense of normalcy. Other losses in the NICU might include the death of a colleague or changing job responsibilities. As nurses, we see a lot, we experience a lot, and we care a lot about our patients and their families. Even before the pandemic, healthcare providers were facing high rates of burnout, as well as stress, anxiety, depression, rising substance abuse numbers, and even suicidality. The COVID-19 pandemic has presented all of us with even greater challenges as we struggle to continue to thrive during a time when there's so much uncertainty and a loss of normalcy. All of these events and feelings can compound. So if you're struggling and feeling sad during this time, it's okay. You may not have even realized all the places where these feelings could be coming from. Another important distinction to make is that grief and depression are not the same. While you may be grieving, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are depressed. As I mentioned, grief is usually connected to a specific event or loss, while depression is a formal mental health diagnosis. In some cases, complicated or unresolved grief could lead to symptoms of depression, but is dependent on a lot of factors. Symptoms of depression may last longer and often require the support of a mental health professional to manage them, which is not usually the case with grieving. 
The second important message I want to convey is that each person deals with loss and grief differently, and there's no one right way to travel that journey. Each person must find those strategies that work well for them. We all need to give ourselves and each other some grace as we navigate through hard times and find activities that work for us by bringing stress relief and maybe even some joy. Next, there's a concept called toxic positivity. This is an obsession with positive thinking. It's the belief that people should put a positive spin on all of their experiences, even those that are profoundly tragic. Often people do try to find positive ways um, or positive things about their experiences to help them cope with the situation. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that because it can be a force for good to help motivate us to do better, you know, get move forward into the future. Um, but as this meme states, it's not realistic to be happy all the time. And you should not feel guilty for experiencing negative emotions. Don't let anybody feel you, allow you to feel guilty for that. But you also don't want to avoid or hide from uncomfortable feelings, as this can lead to increased anxiety, depression, disrupted sleep, increased substance abuse, prolonged grief, or even PTSD. So you need to give yourself a break when you need it. Allow yourself to experience those negative feelings that you have. But the goal is to deal with those emotions and then move forward in a healthy way. So real quickly, I'd like for you to do a self check-in. Um, if you want to share any comments or you know, anything in the chat box about things that resonate with you, um, please feel free to do that. Um, and you can also feel free to take notes if you think that might be helpful so that you can see some of the feelings or challenges that you might be having. Sometimes seeing that written down is helpful. It might also give you some new insights that you hadn't realized before. So how are you feeling right now? If you're feeling distressed, can you decide whether it's a work-related distress or maybe it's more personal in nature? Combination of both. Maybe some of you can relate to having layers of worry. Maybe there's all kinds of places where your stress is coming from. Work, home, our world. In addition to work and life, certainly the pandemic has brought us all kinds of new things to worry about. Is your distress a result of grief or loss or maybe even um, stress from other things in the world? How are you dealing with all that? If you aren't distressed right now, can you think of a time when you were? How did you feel then? Were you anxious, sad, on edge, irritable? Maybe you had some other feelings. Do you think that your family or your colleagues knew that you were struggling? Finally, can you think of a colleague or a family member who's distressed? What are the signs that made you think that they may be having a hard time? So what do we do about all this? Well, identifying the cause of the distress is the first step. It could be, like I said, but there are several causes and that's okay. Sometimes we feel that the weight of the world is upon us and there could be many things that are causing us angst, but we need to recognize and acknowledge each of those things. We also need to decide that we want to make our situation better. Sometimes we can get in this rut of, you know, that we're enjoying kind of being in this place where, you know, we're not moving forward. And that's okay too, as long as you're just staying in that space for a little bit. But you do want to be able to move forward and take actionable steps toward developing that resiliency that'll help carry you through the situation. So now we'll move on um, and talk specifically about loss and grief in the NICU. As NICU nurses, the stories of our patients and their families become our stories too. We're there from the beginning through all the ups and downs. We celebrate milestones with them. We cry with them when things are not going well. And their losses are not theirs alone because we also carry them with us into the world into our daily and professional lives. It's hard to watch, 
and not to be able to take away their pain and sorrow or to give back what seems to have been taken away so unfairly. We want to make it all okay. And sometimes we feel that nothing we say is helpful. And nothing we can say will make it okay, really. We can't fix it. And that can leave us feeling defeated and questioning whether we're good at our job or if this is really what we're meant to do. This is hard work. Saying goodbye is never easy and acknowledging all of our feelings around a death or a loss is also difficult because we grieve too. And in the moment we can't fall apart as that isn't helpful for the family, but we must acknowledge that we were there to witness what happened because it allows that event to become part of our life experience. Each family teaches us something that we carry forward to the next experience. And we all have a story, don't we? That one baby or family or that one moment that we feel defines our career. Some of us have more than one. And some events may have more of an impact on us than others, but they all add up to an amazing journey if we're able to process those emotions and move forward in a healthy way. So the, I think the first type of grief that's experienced in the NICU is anticipatory grief. You may be familiar with this term. This goes on a lot in the NICU, whereby the realization that one's child suffers from a life-threatening illness triggers a grieving process for what could have been, but isn't. It signals the loss of hopes and dreams for the child and for the family. It might be at the end of a long process for the parents if they've struggled with infertility or even a previous loss. It can begin at birth or later when a diagnosis is given. Parents may struggle to cope with the devastating reality of a diagnosis or the uncertainty that the future may hold. I think that as nurses, we also struggle with some anticipatory grief, especially if we have taken care of the baby for a while, if we were their primary nurse, or if there were any ethical dilemmas that accompany the case. In these situations, I think the first step is just feeling confident in knowing what to do. And that could be to have an end of life plan of care in place. Does your unit have a protocol or a checklist to use to help guide you as you're in the moment providing care? And if so, do you feel comfortable following it? If not, there are a couple of published protocols that are available to use as guides. Catlin and Carter is probably the most well-known, but it was published several years ago in 2002. It is old, but it does still remain a very good model. Several professional organizations like NAN also have practice care guidelines that you can access for um, help in forming a protocol. If you don't have a protocol, do you think you could advocate for your unit to adopt one? And what would that look like? There may be other resources you could utilize on your unit. Do you have a unit bereavement committee or a unit chaplain you could call for support? Are there physician colleagues, NNPs, nurse managers, social workers? Do you have NICU psychologists who could, you could call on to help put some of those resources together? Does your unit provide ongoing education about palliative and end-of-life care and bereavement for staff? If not, could you advocate for that training? Do you feel like you had adequate training through nursing school or hospital orientation? If you feel that your education is lacking, you might consider whether that is something you could pursue. For example, LNAC, which is End-of-Life Nursing Education Consortium, is really fabulous. They cover the entire life spectrum, and they do have a pretty good pediatric with neonatal sections. They have a train the trainer program where one person from the unit could get the training and then come back to train the rest of the unit. Again, professional organizations can be helpful with educational opportunities as well. The Hospice and Palliative Nurses Association offers several educational opportunities that you don't necessarily need to be a member to access. And I'm sure there are lots of other organizations as well. Again, thinking about personnel resources, are there individuals who could provide a lecture or some supplemental education on this topic? Does your hospital have a palliative care team you could connect with? So really just thinking about what and who could help you develop the skills that you need to provide good care. 
Each unit might do things a little bit differently, but there are four elements pictured here that should always be part of the end of life care plan. First, parents should always be part of the discussion. Do whatever the family wants to do within reason. Follow their lead. They'll let you know what they need and what they want. Monitor the infant closely for pain or discomfort and alleviate any symptoms or suffering. Parents and family members should be given the opportunity to spend as much time as they want with their baby before, during, and after the death. Does your unit have private space for the family to spend time and say goodbye? If not, can you create some privacy for them? Do you have legacy building activities available that you could offer for them to do during this time? Or is there a support area of the hospital that could help? For example, child life can often help with siblings. I'll talk about some other options in just a minute. Lastly, postmortem care should be done according to hospital policy. Undressing the infant, taking all the lines and tubes out, unless it's an unexpected death or within 24 hours of admission, and then wrapping in a shroud. I remember this part of the plan being the hardest of all, especially when I was caring for a primary patient. Is there someone who's available to support you with this part? the charge nurse or another colleague, remember that you don't have to do any of these things alone. Having a plan and utilizing all of your resources is the first step to alleviating distress around providing end of life care. So some ideas for memory making are memory boxes of baby's items. You can include footprints, handprints, locks of hair, pictures, some of their clothing, a blanket, ID bands, hospital card, hair bows, a preemie diaper, really anything that speaks to the baby's life. There are often local organizations that will donate memory boxes and or blankets. Um, Angel Gowns is an organization that will supply beautiful gowns made from recycled wedding dresses for babies to wear for pictures or for burial. One of those gowns is in the lower right hand corner of that slide. Um, or maybe you could find a local sewing group who'd be interested in making the dresses for the unit. The, the Angel Gowns has the patterns that are available for download. There's a company called Now I Lay Me Down to Sleep. It's a national company with volunteer photographers. And if they're available in their area, it's a really nice option for families to have pictures taken. These pictures are free to the family. There's also an option for medical staff to become affiliated photographers. And then there are lots of items that are available for purchase online if you have a budget for that, um, if your bereavement committee could help with that, um, that can be used for memory making, such as molds um, or necklaces, things like that. And if the family doesn't want all these things at the time, you should do it anyway and then save it. They may want it later. On our unit, we have had families decline and then later call back and ask if we have anything left. This can also be a really helpful way for you as the nurse to process the feelings that you're having around the death and say goodbye to the baby. I think another challenge is knowing what to say. Sometimes it feels really awkward and you aren't sure that the family will even want to hear what you have to say. So I have some tips for the best and worst things to say. We're gonna start with the worst and these have actually been reported as real things that well-meaning people have said to someone experiencing a loss. At least you know you can get pregnant. He or she is in a better place. God only gives us what we can handle. Everything happens for a reason. You're young, you can have another child. God needed her more than you. I know how you feel. Maybe you weren't ready to be a mom yet. Be strong. You are so strong, I could never handle that. Some of those things can be really offensive to someone who is experiencing a loss. And there are many more better things that we can say. One of the most important things is that when you're talking to a family, call the baby by name. They want to hear their baby's name. You can say, I'm so sorry for your loss. There are no right words, just know that I care. I don't know how you feel, but I am here to help. You are in my thoughts and prayers. 
My favorite memory of your baby is, I'm sorry I can't take this pain away. You can always also encourage them to share their feelings, their stories, and their memories. Or you can say nothing. Just sitting there with the person is enough. Giving them a hug is enough. When you don't know what to say, just being there and them knowing that you are there is enough. There should be some kind of ongoing support for staff as well as parents. For staff, critical incident stress debriefings can be helpful. And we know from the poll at the beginning that a lot of you are doing these debriefings, which is great to see. Um, this is a great way for all of the people who were involved in the event to come together and process that in a structured way. It can be led by hospital pastoral care, the unit chaplain, nursing leaders, physicians. Uh, families really appreciate it when um, staff come to events like the funeral or the annual hospital-based memorial service, um, as it shows the family that they're still cared about and that they and their baby have not been forgotten. And typically, um, there's no direct staff contact outside of these events. So these are good ways to connect with the family um, and to still help process um, the feelings that you're having. For parents, other ways um, that we can show them support is by sending cards. Um, our unit in the past has sent those for the first year following the death. They, send, um, they are sent out by the bereavement committee um, and the first card is sent out immediately and signed by everyone who took care of the baby or who had been close to the family. And then other cards are sent out um, just from the bereavement committee at three months, six months and one year. Um, another idea is to send a gift um, in November or December around the holidays. Um, or to send an anniversary gift. The gift around the holidays um, could be an easier to manage um, lift depending on the number of deaths per year that your unit experiences. Um, keeping track of the anniversaries and then timing the mailings could be a little bit more challenging. Um, some of the ideas, um, things that we've used for the holiday gift are ornaments or a picture frame something like that, um, that's not religious, but could have a wide meaning for any culture or faith. So now let's touch a little bit on loss and grief beyond the NICU, because we all experience grief and loss outside of the NICU too. Perhaps we've experienced the death of a person we've loved, a family member or a friend, or maybe we need to support others during their loss. Um, further, the COVID-19 pandemic has certainly provoked um, a lot of feelings and sadness, and we've all lost out on something during this pandemic. Um, we've witnessed an upheaval in our society, as well as in our healthcare, education, and economic systems, which may have shaken your understanding of the world around us. Over the last 18 months or so, there have been a lot of changes that have resulted in feelings of loss and grief that need to be processed on top of feelings of loss and grief that may have arisen from a death. So how can we help others? Well, first, we want to understand the grieving process. Be a good listener. Respect the person's way of grieving, because we don't all grieve the same way. Be accepting of mood swings. One day they might be feeling okay, and then the next day they may not want to talk to anybody. Know what to say and what not to say. So we've already gone over some of those things um, that we can say. Don't try to explain the loss, just be there to listen and then offer words that can touch their heart. Offer practical assistance. So there's lots of things that we can do um, for our friends, our neighbors, our families um, around practical assistance. We can offer to shop for groceries or run errands, drop off a casserole or other food. We can help with funeral arrangements take care of housework for them, such as cleaning or laundry. We can drive them anywhere that they might need to go, offer to watch their pets, or pick up their children from school, or even watch them if needed. We can also help them do normal activities, 
take them to lunch or out to a movie, accompany them on a walk, just spend time with them. And then instead of saying, well, I'm available if you need anything, offer up a tangible thing you could do for them. Say, this is what I'm going to do and when. They appreciate not having to ask and just knowing that those things will be done. Provide ongoing support. This is really important once the funeral is over and everyone has gone home and they're alone with their thoughts. Your support could be very valuable. Don't make any assumptions based on their outward appearances. Don't say you look so well or you are so strong because this puts pressure on the person to keep up appearances and hide their true feelings. You may also offer extra support on special days like holidays, birthdays, and anniversaries as these dates sometimes reawaken grief. And then finally, watch for warning signs of complicated grief or depression. Six months is usually the time period that has been identified clinically as ex an acceptable time frame before they begin to call the person's grief complicated. But I think depending on the person and the nature of the loss, it could take longer. But if the person's symptoms don't gradually start to fade or if they get worse over time, this may be a sign that normal grief has evolved into something more serious, such as clinical depression. And in that case, you wanna encourage the grieving person to seek professional help if you observe any of the following warning signs after the initial grieving period. So difficulty functioning in their daily life, extreme focus on the death, excessive bitterness, anger, or guilt, neglecting personal hygiene, alcohol or drug abuse, inability to enjoy life, withdrawing from others, constant feelings of hopelessness, or talking about dying or suicide. It can be tricky to bring up your concerns to the bereaved person as you don't want to be perceived as invasive or intrusive and you don't want to offend, offend them. Um, but in, so instead of telling the person what to do, try stating your own feelings. I'm troubled by the fact that you aren't sleeping. Perhaps you could look into getting help and I'd be happy to help you do that. So what are some strategies that we can help ourselves cope? So first, recognizing that even in the NICU, death is inevitable. Talk with colleagues, friends, family. Pray or meditate. The session that Amy had right before this was wonderful. Give yourself a break when you need it. Engage in a relaxing activity. Be outdoors. Never try to look for a reason for why things are happening and try not to dwell in grief. You wanna use adaptive coping strategies rather than avoidance or emotional distance. And some of these strategies might work better for you than others. You might have to you know, try a few things out, see how it fits. And then be aware of the risk of cumulative grief. Our personal experiences combined with the loss experienced as a healthcare provider can pile up. And this is called compounded or cumulative grief. These losses can come from various sectors of our life, but put together, it's a big pile of grief and loss to deal with. Cumulative grief can occur when an individual experiences either multiple losses all at once or experience a loss before processing an, an earlier loss. It can build up even over years. You may begin to wonder how much more loss you can endure, and there's a tendency then to avoid the painful feelings of grief. And this can lead to burnout and compassion fatigue. <laughs> Sorry, my dogs are crazy. Um, so here are some tips for managing cumulative grief. Um, allow yourself to feel pain and sorrow. When we avoid pain and sorrow, it can stress our physical, mental, and emotional health because suppressed pain will come out in some form at some time. Recognize your grief and sit with the pain for as long as you need. Accept all of your feelings, even the feelings you don't like. It's also okay to be angry. Own your grief. 
Don't allow anyone to dictate how you should or should not grieve, especially multiple losses. Healing does not occur in a straight line or have one timetable. Heal at your own pace and expect some relapses. Don't compare your grieving style or expression with anyone else's. You are unique and therefore your grief will be unique to your personality and coping style. But remember that you're not alone in your grief. Seek out others who can help you process in a healthy way. Have a daily routine. Having a daily routine may help you feel a small sense of control. A daily routine might be as simple as waking up and going to bed at the same time or doing one thing every day to promote self-care. And then you wanna practice that self-care. Self-care sometimes is an overused buzzword, but it really is important when you're coping with loss or multiple losses. Find things that are calming. And again, this is gonna look different for every person. Do what works for you. Be patient with yourself. Grieving multiple losses takes time. Some days you'll feel strong enough to cope with the intense feelings, and other days you'll feel like giving up. Each day is a new day. If nothing seems to work, you may need to seek professional help, and there should be no stigma around that. A trained bereavement counselor can help you navigate the complicated nature of cumulative grief. You are vulnerable, so be gentle with yourself. And don't, don't postpone your mourning. Do it now, because if you don't deal with it now, it will come out in other ways later. And it could come out in other ways as burnout or compassion fatigue. Burnout re results from stresses in the workplace, while compassion fatigue is an emotional and physical burden created by the trauma of helping others in distress, which leads to a reduced capacity for empathy towards others. Um, and we are at great risk um, of experiencing compassion fatigue as nurses. So here are some of the symptoms. Um, there's a wide range of symptoms from falling asleep during meetings and appointments, dreading activities, having physical symptoms of headaches, GI issues, um, feeling like you never get enough sleep, having more body aches than normal. Um, you're becoming emotional with your patients, your coworkers, your family. You hate your job and you're considering that you may not be good at what you do. Um, some other symptoms might manifest as grief, panic attacks, resentment, memory problems, nightmares, um, you know, a whole list of things. This collaborative statement came out in 2016 that called attention to burnout syndrome in critical care healthcare professionals. It was a call for action. And this was a concern pre-COVID. And it's even more of a concern now. Again, pre-COVID, 43% of inpatient nurses have a high degree of emotional exhaustion. Further, 18% of registered inpatient nurses had depression versus a national prevalence of approximately 9%, double. In 2017, a National Academy of Medicine discussion paper also reported that nurse suicide was on the rise. Again, all pre-COVID. It's gonna be really important to see how these numbers change following the pandemic. It's okay to feel grief over our losses. It allows us to process those feelings in a healthy way, but we also wanna make progress to get out of that darkness. And the good news is that grief is natural and most people are quite resilient. So we're gonna hit a few strategies here for developing resiliency, because I think we're about out of time, um, but you want to develop a strong social network. Building those strong, positive relationships with loved ones and friends can provide you with needed support and acceptance. Um, you want to make every day meaningful. Do something that gives you a sense of accomplishment and purpose each day. And set goals to help you look forward to the future with meaning. Learn from your experiences. Remember how you've coped with hardships in the past. Consider the skills and strategies that helped you through those hard times and then use those again. Believe in your abilities. Remain hopeful, be optimistic. You can't change the past, but you can always look toward the future. Take care of yourself. Tend to your own needs and feelings. Participate in activities and hobbies you enjoy. Include physical activity in your daily routine and get plenty of sleep. And then be proactive. Don't ignore your problems. Instead, figure out what needs to be done, make a plan and take action. 
We also know that regular self-care is so important, and there are many things that you can do to provide yourself with some of that self-care, and we've talked about many of those tonight. You cannot pour from an empty cup. You have to take care of yourself first. Again, not everyone will enjoy those same self-care activities, and only you know what's helpful for you. Some people like to meditate or do deep breathing exercises. For me, that doesn't work. It only makes me more anxious, so I might put relaxing music on instead or I might exercise. Find a few things that you know bring you relief and then regularly schedule some time to do those things. So I just wanted to end by sharing a few places where you can find additional resources. The first is the National Academy of Medicine. They have a clinician well-being knowledge hub and I've put the links here. Um, they offer a ton of resources um, that are looking all at clinician well-being. There's some on there now that they've just recently posted about COVID-19, um, but all of their things pre-COVID that they were working on are still there. The National Institute of Mental Health, they now have a whole section of their website on shareable resources on coping with COVID-19. Um, this is one of their downloadable graphics. They have several of these. Um, and as, as well as social media messages that you can use and share with others. They have news stories about coping with COVID-19, information and strategies for dealing with difficult times, helpful videos, as well as public health and research information available at that website on the slide. And then in very timely fashion, HPNA or the Hospice and Palliative Nurses Association just released some free grief resources yesterday so this was a late add to my slides, um, but it's a, a series of five short YouTube videos that cover important aspects of dealing with grief as a healthcare provider. These videos are about two to five minutes in length and have a downloadable resource guide to accompany them. They've also created a survey for viewers to give feedback about the value of this educational series, um, as well as to provide feedback on other topics. So again, I thank you for being here tonight. I hope that you found something helpful for any situation you might be experiencing either in your personal life or in your professional life that you can take forward. Um, again, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have at this time and my email address is there. So um, you know, if I can answer any questions about anything that I've presented tonight, please feel free to reach out. So thank you, I'm gonna stop sharing and send it back. Thank you so much, Chris. Does anybody have any questions for Chris? We have a few minutes that we can answer, have any questions anybody might have. Wait, see if anybody puts anything in the chat box. Okay, well, it doesn't look like we have any questions. So thank you so much, Chris. Um, I'm sure we all learn a few new ways to cope with loss and we'll be able to use them in the future. Uh, giving us what to say and stuff that will help. I know so many nurses because a lot of times in that situation, we just don't know what to say and what the correct thing to say to those parents are. So thank you so much. Um, before we go, we want to let you know that we'll be following up with a quick survey to get your insights on tonight's events, as well as to find out what topics you'd like us to consider for future events. Please take a moment to answer that survey that will be sent in an email um, so we can plan the most meaningful events in the future. I'm excited to share the date for our next NAN Connections, scheduled for Thursday, October 14th, from 6 to 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, the same time as today's event. During the session, we're going to be doing part two of dealing with bullying in the NICU. We had our first part in June, and we didn't even get through a majority of our questions because we just had so many great conversations about the NICU and questions and what to do in bullying. So we came, we're coming back with a part two so we can finish that up. Um, we will be able to do a quick overview of what we discussed in June and finish the questions that we did not get a chance to talk about. Look for more details to come in various NAN communications. And remember, these events are free, not just for NAN bumbers, but for the entire neonatal nursing community. Please encourage your peers to attend and connect with us in the future. Also, don't forget NAN's National Conference is September 13th to the 15th and will be held virtually this year. Make sure you register if you haven't already. 
And finally, we're going to announce today's winner for the Kelly. Holly Bellish. Yeah. Kelly, we've got one question in the chat that I just didn't want to miss before you announce the winner, if that's okay. okay. Do you see it there or do you want me yeah. to read it? Is it, where does, okay, yeah, from yep. Diana. Yep. Yeah. Diana asked, where does moral distress fit into this? The moral distress that NICU nurses have reported to me about caring for an NAS infant, trying to care for the infant while being upset over the infant's drug exposure, and there are nurses who don't want to care for an NAS infant because they don't feel they can be supportive to the moms. Um, yeah, well, I didn't address really moral distress around any of this either, because I think that could be a whole lecture in itself. Um, you know, there is a lot of moral distress that occurs around caring for infants with end of life. And certainly there are other ethical issues um, with some of these other infants that we try to care for. Um, you know, I think that um, just really trying to continue to process those feelings with people on the unit, um, trying to understand what best practices are um, around treating NAS babies, and you know, just trying to get you know the most information that you can get, um, and and just trying to support those families. Um, but NAS is um, really um, a hard a hard thing because we do have definite um, thoughts about that. Um, and I had actually um, sent Diana a message in the chat and, you know, I'll connect with you more offline, Diana, because I think that I have some other resources that I could help share. Thank you, Chris. Diana, did that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Yes, okay, it did. <laughs> sounds good. Okay, so we're going to announce tonight's winner. Um, is Kate Rivert still on? Is she still present? Kate Rivert. Molly, do you see her on? Oh, yeah, nope. but I'm not all the way through. Hold on one sec. Nope, I don't think so. Oh, yeah, I, she's here. She's oh, here. Oh, no. I think I, oh. I muted everybody. So let me see if I can unmute Kate. Kate, are, Rivert, are you here? I am here, but I'm in Australia, so I'm happy for you to send it on to somebody else. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> that's amazing that you're calling in from Australia. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank today. you. <laughs> Thanks for a great presentation, Molly. Do you want me to move on to the next one then? Yep, but we'll okay. some, we'll find we'll figure something out for Kate. But um, yep. but yes, let's share that Spa Finder gift card with somebody who can actually use it in. The U.S. Okay, so Christine Ballard is Christine Ballard still here? Can you hear me? Yes, Christine Ballard. Congratulations, you won. Is Yay, it possible you. for you to turn on your camera so we can get a picture? Um, sure. I mean, I'm in okay. in the dark and feeding my baby, but let me <laughs> try it for a second. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. That was Congratulations. <laughs> okay, so I just want to say thanks again for joining us tonight and taking the time out of your busy schedule. We hope to see you guys at NAN's virtual annual conference next month. We'll see you guys later. Thanks again.